Okay, well, welcome to the uh, first in four lectures on respiration in the lungs. Uh, and so the upload date for this is going to be November 25th, 2020. Uh, so I'll start by just kind of a, a rapid fire summary of what we did in uh, lecture 18. Um, and so this was focused on the lymphatic capillaries in the uh, lymphatic system. This is the system that returns in interstitial fluid that comes out of capillaries that doesn't make it into the venous end, brings it back to the venous system through the lymphatic system. Uh, we talked about lymphatic capillaries uh, having mini valves. When the pressure rises in the extracellular fluid, um, uh, fluid which is then called lymph when it's in these, these vessels, will, will move into the system and then be transported up again to merge with the venous system. Uh, and so Eventually, this is going to, to merge with the venous system. You're going to have emptying into the right lymphatic duct. This is this side of the body. And then the rest of the body, so the majority of the body, is with the uh, thoracic duct. And this is on the left, left hand side here. And so the, these spots that, that uh, the lymphatic system is emptying into, this is underneath the clavicle. And remember, I said that this is this bone right here. In addition to returning uh, this uh, fluid, that comes out of the capillaries. The lymphatic system is also an immune organ. So you have T cells, B cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. These are all working together in a supporting structure made by reticular cells. This is called a stroma, um, and, and it performs kind of a surveillance function for the immune system. Uh, we talked about different lymphoid organs, uh, secondary organs such as the lymph nodes, spleen, and the malt, as well as primary organs such as the thymus and the red bone marrow. So today what we're going to be doing is talking about uh, the beginnings of, of lung anatomy and physiology um, and then throughout the next four lectures which will take us all the way to the end of the course we're going to learn about how these structures facilitate gas exchange and how all this is regulated. So what we're talking about is these these uh, uh, in particular is how we're getting air into the body down into the lungs and ultimately the sites of gas exchange. And as we'll see, this occurs in these regions called alveoli. Uh, so what are you gonna to learn to do? Uh, here's the learning objective, strike in the syllabus, 6.1 to 6.3, mostly focused on anatomy today. I've indicated the relevant sections of the chapter here. We're on chapter 22, we skipped chapter 21 and we won't be covering that in, in this course. Um, and as usual, I've indicated some web resources as well. Uh, so, respiratory system, major function. What does it do? It's bringing in oxygen for cellular respiration and getting rid of carbon dioxide, which is a byproduct of cellular respiration. Respiration in the circulatory system must be closely coupled in order to work properly. The respiratory system is also involved in olfaction and speech. Speech is talking, just what I'm doing to you now. Olfaction just means smell. Respiration is something that we can divide into four processes. Uh, one of, or two of these involve the respiratory system, and two of these involve the circulatory system. So the respiratory system, we have pulmonary ventilation. This is, is breathing. This is simply the movement of air in and out of the lungs. Okay, it's just getting the air into your lungs. External respiration. External res respiration means the exchange of oxygen or carbon dioxide at the level of the lungs and blood. So moving things in and out of the blood at the lungs. Then the circulatory system takes over. A circulatory system transports oxygen or carbon dioxide in the other direction and then supports internal respiration. Internal respiration is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between those blood vessels and the various tissues. So here we're talking about getting oxygen directly into those tissues. Okay. Uh, this just shows those four processes again. I've just gone over this. Uh, again, we have pulmonary ventilation. This is breathing, uh, bringing air in and out. Um, and we're, we're going to talk about this in more detail. This involves both inspiration and expiration. External respiration, moving into the blood vessels. Transport, okay, through the circulatory system that we've been talking about. And then internal respiration. Last stage, bringing things directly to the tissues or in the other direction, things coming out of the tissues. Major organs. Uh, we can divide the respiratory system into two, uh, two things, the upper respiratory system and the lower respiratory system. 
upper includes the nose and the nasal, nasal cavity, so just the, the area around the nose. Uh, the sinuses, we'll talk a little bit about those, the pharynx. Once we get uh, past the pharynx down into the larynx, uh, this is called the lower respiratory system. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the larynx, as I mentioned, the trachea, bronchi, and the various branches. Uh, and, and these, along with the alveoli, will make up the lungs. Okay, so uh, we're going to start off talking about upper respiratory system. So, so part one, upper respiratory system. Um, the nose, most of you know what a nose is. Uh, it's not just for holding up your glasses. It also provides uh, a way for air to get into your, your system. Uh, it moistens and warms the air. This is very important when, when that air is eventually going to go down into your delicate uh, respiratory system, those delicate alveoli structures that we're going to talk about later. Uh, it filters, cleans the air, it serves as, as a resonating chamber for speech, okay? um, and it also has olfactory receptors. What does that mean? Simply smell. Uh, so obviously there's the external nose and, and then the nasal cavity. We're not going to talk too much about the external nose. We are going to talk about a little bit about the internal nose. So you do have uh, uh, structures which will uh, secrete mucus and, and ser what are called serous secretions. Serous is just a, a term that, that means it's derived from blood. Uh, these contain defensins, which are antimicrobials, and also lysozyme that can break down uh, various materials. So this is an enzyme. Contains cilia. Cilia are, are those sweeping cells. Uh, this can, can sweep contaminants contaminated mucus uh, down towards the throat. So eventually that's going to end up in your digestive system. You're going to digest it in your stomach acids and it can't harm your respiratory system. Uh, inspired air is warmed by, by plexuses of capillaries. So this just means networks of capillaries that, that are very close to the, uh, the surface uh, of, of the nasal cavity. Um, also, it contains very, uh, a lot of uh, nerve endings. These nerve endings are, are basically going to cause sneezing if that's necessary and force particles out of the nose. Again, it's all about protecting your delicate respiratory system. We also have within the nasal cavity, in this diagram, you notice these kind of folds or indentation. These are called conchae. Um, and these are going to increase the uh, mucosal area, so increasing the area of contact. Um, and increase air turbulence. This is all about exposing air going in and coming back out uh, to, to warm and to filter that entire population. This ensures you get turnover of that air, so all of that air is exposed to these various things like antimicrobials, for example. Again, all about heating, filtering, and moistening that air until it goes down to your delicate respiratory system. Uh, and, and the reverse is all, uh, also true in this case. So during exhalation, that's bringing air out. Uh, these structures are going to be important for reclaiming heat and moisture. Uh, sinuses. What is a sinus? Uh, some of you have heard of sinuses. I'm sure some of you have had what's called a sinus headache. And so uh, sinuses are basically um, spaces or cavities within your skull. Okay, And, and they're, they're interconnected with your, your nasal cavity. You don't need to know these different terms. I don't care if you know what an olfactory epithelium is or, or, or um, these different types of sinuses. I just want you to know that, that sinuses have, have functions and they are important. So uh, they do lighten the skull. They, they also help to secrete mucus. And again, provides chambers where air can go around and around and, and moisten um, and, and warm. Uh, and so again, this is gonna be very important uh, as this air is going down into your very delicate respiratory system. Uh, rhinitis. Rhinitis is, uh, you know, we always like to point out these situations where you have a, lot, la you know, a lack of homeostasis. Uh, rhinitis is basically inflammation and of the uh, nasal mucosa. Um, and so, you know, this could be a stuffy nose or an irritated nose. Um, if you always feel like you're, you're going to sneeze, this could be rhinitis. Uh, lots of people have rhinitis in the winter. I feel like I've got some form of this kind of constantly. The danger, of course, is, is it can spread down to your to other areas of the respiratory system, and that's a problem. It can also cause uh, sinus headaches, and so the idea here is that it can lead to, with inflammation, leads to trapping of air in these areas here, and that produces what, what we refer to as a sinus headache. Um, the pharynx, uh, so we nasal passage, then the air is gonna go down through the pharynx. Uh, Funnel-shaped organ, Divided into three parts, we have the nasal pharynx, oral pharynx, behind the nose and, and, the, and the mouth, respectively, and then the laryngeal pharynx. Okay. 
Okay, this is, is mostly composed of, of skeletal muscle. So these are these three regions here shown in red, blue, and then green. Uh, so first the nasal nasopharynx, this is directly behind the nose. Uh, this is basically a, a passageway. So uh, air is coming through the nasal cavity here. It's getting warmed and moistened, and then it's going down into the, into the nasal pharynx. Uh, this contains um, ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. What does that mean? It has ciliated cells that can start uh, sweeping any of that material that, that might have uh, dirt or, or mucus and sweep that down towards the, the um, uh, digestive system that we talked about previously. Um, and so this also includes the soft palate and the uvula um, in this area here, which is involved in, in swallowing. Okay, We're not going to really talk too much about that. Uh, the oropharynx, uh, this is just the next one in line. It's right behind the mouth. So we're talking about this blue part here. Uh, one of the things that's important to realize is that the structure changes a little bit. Um, and so you get, get a change to what's called a stratified squamous epithelium. And the point here is that this is more protective. So, you know, if you go out to eat and you get a lot of spicy food, uh, you need a little bit of protection in that area of, of, of your mouth. And, and so that's, um, that's the purpose of, of that differentiated epithelium. Okay. Um, as we move downwards, you're into the laryngeal pharynx. And here, this is where this starts to be a passageway to food. Okay. Um, and so it says it's upright to the epiglottis. This structure right here is the epiglottis. Okay. Um, and so when you eat food, it's going down here. The epiglottis is going to, going to close when you're eating and food is going to go down in this direction here. Okay. So down here and air is going to go in through this, this uh, direction here. Through, through the larynx, and we'll talk about the larynx next. Um, and this is lined with a, a stratified squamous epithelium. Again, this is performing somewhat of a protective function. Okay, that's the upper respiratory system. Uh, the lower respiratory system, we can divide into conducting and respiratory. Conducting, again, this is all about getting the air into the system. Respiratory is, is, is more about gas exchange. So these are gonna be the lower areas of that respiratory system. Uh, first of all, the larynx. Uh, most of you have heard of a larynx before. This is extending from uh, C3 to C6. Um, this is uh, talking about cervical vertebrae, attaches to a bone called the hyoid bone. Okay, so this is the larynx here that we're talking about. Um, there's three functions. It provides a patent or open airway. That's just simply what this word patent means. It roots food and air into the right chambers. So again, you're having... Um, uh, food go down into the digestive system and air going into this direction here down to the respiratory system. Um, and also it's involved in voice production as well. Um, you can see that the, the, the larynx is actually very rich in cartilage, it contains these various rings of cartilage, um, and these kind of extend down to, to, the, to the tracheal cartilages, cartilages that we'll talk about in, in a moment. Um, a few structures that I'll point out, there's the, the, the epiglottis, okay? Um, this is, again, involved in rerouting food uh, down to the digestive system or preventing food from entering the respiratory system. Um, you don't need to know the different names of, of these different cartilages, okay? Just know that there's a lot of cartilage. One exception, and that is that there's this piece of cartilage here called the thyroid cartilage, and that actually makes up the, the Adam apple, so the, the, this, this area right here, okay? Uh, the, the larynx also contains the, the vocal cords. This is what enables us to, to have speech. Okay, so this is what these vocal cords look like. This is the, 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 the epiglottis, and uh, you can start to see some of these different cartilage uh, pieces here. You, so this is a, a closed form of the vocal cords, and this is the open form. Uh, your voice is actually determined by the length and also the, the tightness of, of these different, uh, of these vocal cords right here. Uh, homeostasis, again, what happens when things go wrong? Uh, when you have inflammation, swelling, or infection of the larynx, uh, you could have laryngitis. This term is probably not new to most of you. This occurs when, when essentially you've lost your voice. Okay, uh, This could be due to, to viral infections, bacterial infections, uh, tumors, chemicals, but also just overuse of the voice. Or, or It can be exacerbated in the winter because of the dry air, for example. Uh, the larynx is going to go down to the trachea. Uh, there's two points to remember to the, to the trachea. Uh, first of all, it's, it's often referred to as the windpipe. It extends from that larynx 
all the way down into the mediastinum. Now you've heard the word mediastinum before. Um, the mediastinum is where the heart is, okay? So we're going all the way down to that area of the chest where the heart is. Um, it's about four inches in length and about three quarter inch in diameter and, and it's a very flexible, okay? Um, trachea has a certain structure. Um, it has three different layers. It has the mucosal layer, submucosal, and a ventita. Um, and so those are shown here, one, two, and three. And then in between you also have this, this line of, of, of hyaline cartilage as well. So you have these rings of cartilage in this structure. Uh, despite this fact, uh, the structure is, is very kind of uh, flexible, okay? Um, and we know that that's true because we can move our, we can, uh, uh, we have food that is going down, in, or not food that's going down, we have air that's going down into this system, and that flexibility is needed in order to conduct that air into the system, okay? Um, this is going to give way into the bronchi, okay? So we have the trachea here, and it deviates into what we call two bronchi. Um, the bronchi are, are these branches that will eventually lead down into the lungs. And so you have the, the, the right and, and the left. The left is actually a little bit longer. So if you look here, you can see that this is, is a little bit longer than the one on our right. Again, we're always looking at the head on. So this side is always going to be um, the right side of the patient and the left side is going to, and this side is going to be the, the left side of the patient. So make sure that you've got your, your, your anatomy and physiology left and right. Correct. Um, so these are then going to branch into into to different sets of branches. So you have the main one that's going to branch into to three on the left side. One, I guess, two and, and three, um, and, and two main branches on, on the right side. And this is because there's actually three lobes on the left and, th and two lobes on the right. Or sorry, uh, on, on the on the right, and, and there's two lobes on on the left. Okay, so two lobes left three lobes on the right. And, and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the, the difference between the right and left lungs in, in a little bit. Um, so these are, are basically, these bronchi are basically going to go down to smaller and smaller pieces. Um, eventually when they become so small that they're less than one millimeter, so get out a ruler and you can see the size of one millimeter, it's very small. They're called bronchioles. The terminal bronchioles are, are, are where these guys kind of end. And, and these have, have diameters that are even smaller, so less than a millimeter. So you have this tree-like pattern that, that kind of snakes throughout your lungs. And it's snaking uh, throughout three lobes on the right and two lobes on the left. Okay, so just again correcting myself there. Um, so, so the bronchi kind of change as, as you go down towards uh, the very small terminal bronchioles. Um, and so, you know, up at the top here at the trachea, you have a very similar structure to, to the trachea, okay? So you have, you know, really rich in cartilage, um, but as you go down towards the bronchioles, you have elastic fibers, and these are going to end up replacing that cartilage altogether. Uh, you also have a, a change in the type of epithelium, okay? Um, and you have increased smooth muscles as you move down towards the, the, um, the, the, the bronchioles. And this allows uh, more kind of control over airflow. So this is important for the regulation of airflow in and out of our lungs. Uh, so the alveoli. So there's a mistake in the slide. This should have an L here. Um, nevertheless, the, the point is that you have these terminal bronchioles here. They divide a little bit more into what we call the respiratory bronchioles. And then you have the, the sac-like structures called the alveoli. Uh, the alveoli are, again, the, the sac-like structures occur on bunches. If you have a cross section of these, so again, cutting uh, through the middle and then looking at what you've got, uh, this is what they look like, okay? So, so they're all kind of interconnected together, not really quite like grapes, so each of these don't have their individual stem, for example. So often people will describe them as, as grape-like bunches, not quite. It'd be it, grape-like if, if the grapes were, were attached directly to the stem of, of the bunch of grapes, okay? Um, you have a lot of these. You have over 300 million alveoli making up most of the lung volume. Uh, there's other parts of the lung, and we're going to address those in a moment. And these are the actual sites of gas exchange. Okay, and so what's really neat is you have these capillary beds in the in the lungs here, and so uh, this is where where blood is going to be coming in to become oxygenated, and then it's leaving once it gets its oxygen. You can see that these are really wrapped around the alveoli, so you have really close connections there, and this is going to facilitate that gas exchange. Okay. 
so, so how tight is this connection? Well, actually, some of the blood vessels, so here, for example, focus on this red area. That's a blood vessel. It actually shares a membrane with some of these alveoli, okay? So this is one of the alveoli here, and it's sharing a membrane with this blood vessel. And this is a close-up. So you have your red blood cells here. Again, uh, capillaries smallest can support you know, only one red blood cell at a time. And you see the distance here is, is very short, so you can have really great gas exchange, and that, that's kind of the point here. This is a very thin membrane. It's less than, than uh, five microns, okay? Um, and uh, again, well, it's very, very fast gas exchange. Two types of cells. You have kind of a structural cell. That's the squamous epithelial cells. So most of the kind of, I don't know what color this is, yellow, gray, whatever, these are, these are squamous epithelium. And these are called uh, type one alveolar cells. And then you have these type two cells here. This is this green guy here. Looks like it's got some, some stuff on it. These are uh, secreting cells and they secrete antimicrobial proteins. That makes sense because you might want to, to uh, get rid of any bacteria de that's down there. And, and, and also surfactant. And surfactant is um, almost like a soap-like substance that, that allows you to break the surface tension in your lungs. That again, allows you to better uh, expand and contract your lungs. Um, you've also got pores between the different alveolar sacs, and this allows you to, to uh, equalize air pressure between those regions and to facilitate gas exchange with your, your, your entire lung volume. So the lungs themselves, these are, are what's occupying most of your, your thoracic cavity, um, except for the mediastinum. So again, mediastinum is this area in here where, where your heart goes. Um, you have uh, the root of the lung, which is in this area, um, and this is uh, where you have um, uh, attachment of blood vessels, and the bronchi are also attaching there as well. Uh, you have the base of the lung, so this would be the base here, um, and then you have, um, the, please note that the, the lungs are sitting on top of the diaphragm, so that's this muscle-like structure here. This goes up and down as you breathe. In the last lecture, we talked about the spleen basically being on the other side of this diaphragm. Okay. One thing to note is that the apex of the lungs, these are going to be uh, pointing upwards. Um, this is actually in contrast to the heart. We talked about the heart having an apex. This is just defined as kind of the pointy end of the organ. And for the heart, this is actually down and to the left. For the lungs, this is the apex. And, and true to what we normally think of an apex, it's actually going to be pointed upwards. This word, uh, hilum. Hilum is found on the, the, the medial stinal surface, um, and this is the area where, where blood vessels go in and out of an organ. Okay, So if you're paying attention in the previous lecture, when we're talking about the spleen, the spleen also has a hilum. It's a general term, meaning this, the, the area of the organ where the, where the major blood vessels go in and out. Uh, you can see that, that the, again, the lungs are not mere images of each other. You have three, again, three lobes here on the right, and you have two lobes here on the left, uh, and you also have this little notch. This is called the cardiac notch. What goes there, of course, it's the heart, okay? So the heart is in the mediastinum uh, in the cardiac notch that is formed by the left lung. Of course, it overlaps a little bit with the central area of your body as well. Um, so again, Three lobes left, two, three lobes on the right, two lobes on the left. Okay. Uh, so this just takes a different view of what this looks like. So you have these these bronchi getting into to smaller and smaller uh, areas, um, and uh, they they are fed by by their own uh, blood supply. Uh, you have most of the lung tissue uh, making up um, made up of these alveoli. Uh, you have the uh, space here for the heart that's called the cardiac notch. This is the heart, of course, is going to be uh, behind the, uh, the breastplate um, and it's going to be in front of your, your spinal cord. So this just shows the relative position of the lungs relative to your other organs. Okay, And again, you have very tight interconnections between the blood supply and the bronchi, Okay, essentially right up against each other. 
The lungs are, are, are unique in the fact that, that they're divided into various subdivisions. And you have usually more on the right, so, so 10, for example, and, and you know, 8 to up to 10, I suppose, on, on the left. Um, and the idea is that these all have their own blood supply, their own veins, own arteries, and actually their own lymphatics as well. Um, and so the idea is if one of these areas becomes diseased, it can easily be removed. The lungs can go on and, and do what they do, so to speak. Um, the lungs ha have, have two different types of, of circulation. The first is the pulmonary circulation. And so this is what we, we, we talked about previously. We talked about the heart. So we have pulmonary arteries that are, are moving uh, the... Um, the pulmonary arteries are, are going to be moving uh, the blood from the from the heart uh, to the lungs, um, and these are going to branch into these pulmonary net, uh, capillary networks. Uh, you then have pulmonary veins, and uh, these are going to carry oxygenated blood from the respiration areas back to the heart. So that's going back into that left atrium. This is considered a low pressure system and a high volume system. Okay. Um, and we also note that the, the epithelium in this area contains a lot of enzymes that act on different uh, substances in the blood. And if you recall, when we were talking about regulation of blood pressure, we talked about this enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme. We kind of glossed over it the, during the, that period of time that this was produced by the lungs, but here it is again, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme involved in the regulation of blood pressure. And, and that is a, a hormone. Uh, you also have the bronchial circulation. And so this is akin to kind of the coronary circulation of, of the heart. The heart is, is a muscle. It needs its, its blood supply. Uh, there, there's uh, the, the, the lungs have, have, have tissue in there. It has muscles. It needs its own uh, uh, blood supply as well. And it needs uh, uh, veins to take away um, uh, waste products. And so just as you have coronary arteries and coronary veins, you have bronchial arteries and bronchial veins serving that muscle within that bronchial structure. Okay, um, These will anastomose with the pulmonary veins. Um, anastomose is, again, uh, means that there's connections between these pulmonary veins. Okay, So that's just what that means. It's different routes uh, within the same circulatory system. Again, don't get confused. Here we're talking about the pulmonary circulation. This is what we talked about back on day one when we were talking about the heart. And this is the bronchial circulation that is providing uh, oxygen and then taking away waste from the muscles, for example, that are within the bronchial, uh, the bronchi itself. Okay, so two different types of circulation. Uh, innervation of the lungs. We're going to come back to this, um, although not in too much detail. But what I want you to know for now is that things in the lungs are a little bit different than they are in your blood vessels. When we talk about blood vessels, we talked about sympathetic tone. Uh, sympathetic tone causing a constant restriction of your blood vessels. Here, the sympathetics are responsible for dilation, okay? And the parasympathetics are responsible for constriction of those bronchi. So just keep that in mind as we go over the next few lectures because that's going to be important for understanding how all the regulation fits together here. Okay, the pleura. The pleura is basically um, a, a thin membrane sac that is surrounding uh, the lungs. Okay, um, again, uh, very similar to what we learned when we talked about the heart. And so, uh, again, using kind of identical terms as well as, as we did when we talked about the heart, you have the parietal pleura. So this is the membrane on the thoracic wall. This is the outermost layer. And then you have the visceral pleura. And just like we talked about with the heart, you have, you have fluid that is between these two layers. Okay? And this is going to provide uh, a lubrication and help in the expansion and recoil of the lungs. So again, very similar to what we learned with the heart um, and, and the, the epicardium. Uh, and so if we're going to look at where those structures are, so this double membrane sac here surrounding the lungs, it would be this structure right here. Okay, so I'm just tracing it around on, first of all, on the right side, and then on the left side here. And this is very important in the process of, of, of breathing, as we'll see in the next few slides. Okay, 
So now what we're going to do is we're going to go over a, a little bit of breathing mechanics, um, just talking about ideas of pressure, um, and uh, then we're going to build on this in the next lecture. Okay. Um, so as we talked about previously, pulmonary ventilation, uh, this is one part of, of, of respiration. Pulmonary ventilation is, is getting air in and out of the lungs. So uh, inspiration is what we refer to as, it's not just a good idea, inspiration is, is gases flowing into the lungs. Expiration is gas exiting the lungs. Pretty straightforward. When we talk about, about pressures in the lungs, and, and really this is what airflow and, and uh, ventilation is all about, we're always talking relative to, to atmospheric pressure. And so when we have something like uh, 760 millimeters mercury, that's the pressure that we feel uh, all the time, just being at sea level. We can refer to this as, as one atmospheric pressure. But uh, to keep things simple and to not have to deal with numbers like 760 and to put things in the proper context, we, we think about respiratory uh, pressures, or it's custom to talk about respiratory pressures, always relevant to atmospheric pressure. And so if you have a pressure in your lungs, for example, that is the same as the environment around us, then we say that it's got zero respiratory pressure. Um, and this is because relative to the atmospheric pressure, it's the same. It's not less, it's not greater, it's just zero. You can also have negative respiratory pressure when it's less than atmospheric pressure and positive respiratory pressure when it's greater than atmospheric pressure. Again, atmospheric pressure, this is just the weight of all the atoms in the air pressing down on us. Okay, And we're defining all the pressures that we're going to talk about, somewhat because of convenience, uh, somewhat because of, of custom, that's just the way that people do it, um, relative to that. So if we talk about uh, having zero respiratory pressure, that means it's identical to what we observe in the atmospheric pressure. Okay, So let's look at the different pressures that we deal with in the lungs, and we'll deal with these one at a time. So the first pressure we want to think about is intrapulmonary pressure. This is what I was just talking about. This is the pressure within your lungs, within your alveoli. Okay, um, This might also be called intraalveolar pressure because of that fact. This is going to fluctuate with breathing, um, and eventually it's always going to um, equalize with the atmospheric pressure. So, um, and we're going to talk about this more in the, in the next class, but the idea is that eventually, whatever is happening out here in the environment, your lungs down in your alveoli, the intrapulmonary pressure, so this, this pink area that's representing all that volume of the alveoli, that's eventually going to equal what's happening in the atmospheric pressure. And after we get through some of these definitions, we'll see how that comes into play when we start talking about the very mechanics of breathing. So we're just learning now about some of the definitions of these different pressures right now. Um, Interpleural pressure. This is the pressure within that fluid-filled space. Okay. Um, this also fluctuates with breathing, and it's usually less than, than the, than the intrapulmonary pressure. Okay, so the pressure within this bag essentially surrounding the lungs is always less than we see here. Both of them change as you breathe, but this difference is, is maintained. This one is always less. This one here is always going to end up equaling what happens in the atmosphere. And it's important that this is less than this because if it's not, then the lungs can collapse. If you have pressure, that's greater here, then that's going to force the lungs to collapse. And we don't want this. We want the, the lungs to remain inflated. And so there's actually two forces that, that act to promote lung collapse. The first of these is, is the fact that they're very elastic in nature. And this is due to the elastic uh, tissue, which is down in the, in, in the bronchioles. And so they're always going to try to, to assume the smallest size. So if you take an elastic and you let it go, it's always going to try to assume its smallest shape. Um, and then the second one that, that's um, trying to, to um, collapse is the alveolar fluid. Okay, and so there, there's fluid on the alveoli. Um, this is important for gas exchange, but it also um, it provides tension, it provides surface tension. It's pulling those alveoli together, and they're trying to assume the smallest shape. So those are the two things that are, are making the lungs 
push inwards, okay? And part of the, part of the reason why this uh, difference in pressure is important is that counters that, uh, these forces here, and allows the, the lungs to remain inflated. And so part of that has to do with the fact that you have the elasticity of the chest wall that is pulling your thorax outward, okay? And so this pressure that's between uh, the, the intraportal space, the intraportal pressure, that's kind of going to depend on all of these things going on. But in total, if everything's working properly, it's going to be less than this interpulmonary pressure. And that has to be the case, otherwise the lungs are going to collapse. Finally, we have transpulmonary pressure, and that's just simply the difference between these two. So lungs will collapse if the intrapulmonary pressure, interporal pressure is greater or equal to the lung pressure or, or the intrapulmonary pressure. So if this one here in the gray is greater than the one in the pink, the lungs will collapse. If the intrapulmonary pressure, the one in the pink, is greater than the one in the gray, then the lungs will expand. Okay, so this is zero relative to the atmosphere, so meaning that it's exactly what the atmosphere is, um, and it is um, that's going to be greater than, than this, which is negative four relative to the atmosphere. Again, it's just by convention that we're, we're thinking of everything relative to what's going on in the atmosphere. So this is the transpulmonary pressure. So to look at everything again, we have atmospheric pressure, that's what's going out in the environment. We have... Uh, pulmonary pressure um, or intrapulmonary pressure um, or alveolar pressure, it can be called. This is, this is the pink area. Um, this is the pressure within your lungs. Eventually, this is always going to equalize out with atmospheric pressure. Then you have the, the pressure within this gray intracoral uh, space. This is always going to be less than both the atmospheric pressure and the pressure uh, within the alveoli. And that is necessary because if it is greater, then the lungs are going to collapse. So if that doesn't make sense, let's take a look at an example. So imagine a situation where you have an injury on the outside. What's going to happen here? And so this is a nice gruesome diagram where they show, I guess, somebody getting stabbed with a knife. And, and the idea here is that, that what happens is that you're now going to have the atmospheric pressure on the outside is going to end up equalizing with the interporeal space. And so this is going to go from, from negative 4 in the gray to 0. And then if that happens, these are now equal, and the tendency will be to collapse. Same thing happens on the other side. So if you have an injury on the other side, an internal injury, same thing. You're going to have equalization of the pressures here, and the pressure within the interporeal space will uh, equal what's happening in the pulmonary space, and what you'll end up with is lung collapse. Notice, though, that the lungs are, are both surrounded by their own pleura. And so if something happens to one, the other one can still function fine. So it's possible to have one lung collapse, but not the other. So these are the different pressures that we need to consider when we think about the mechanics of breathing and how that brings air in and then ultimately out of our respiratory system. Again, this is simply referred to as ventilation. Okay, so summary today, we learned about the anatomy of the respiratory system um, and, and had an intro into pressures of the lung. Um, and so I'll, I'll pick up there again next time and we'll use what we learned about the, the various pressures uh, to learn more about the mechanics of breathing. And so the rest of the lecture, again, is just these review questions. Have a look and we'll tackle those during our one-on-one our -on -one sessions um, uh, live uh, uh, sessions, the weekly office hours. Um, with that, if you have any other questions, please don't uh, hesitate to email me and uh, have a great day.